it's good to see you again this morning and we're so blessed because we know that every Sunday God has prepared something for all of us and I'm excited because today we are starting a new series and we'll be focusing on the theme of leadership okay uh, many of our you know young professionals here are next in line leaders many of you also are in a leadership positions in your particular fields of business or employment but almost all of you who are married are leaders of your family, especially the men, okay? So we will start a series on leadership, and we'll be starting with the life of Joshua, okay? Joshua, can you say Joshua? First of all, let's look at, the, at his name, no? Joshua, his name actually originally is Hosea. That's not his real name. That was the name that Moses gave to him. And Hosea actually means what salvation that's his original name can you go to numbers chapter 13 verse 8 okay numbers 13 8 you will see the original name of joshua hosea okay and he comes from the tribe of ephraim how many of you i know who ephraim was so who is ephraim the son of joseph the dreamer okay Joseph who became Prime Minister of Egypt, okay, under Pharaoh. The Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers, but he then rose up to be one of the greatest leaders in the history of Egypt, okay? Some identified Joseph to be Imhotep in the history of Egypt, okay? So, Joseph uh, was the great, great, great ancestor of Hosea, and he comes from a very, you know, a uh, famous bloodline okay with Joshua as, with Joseph as your ancestor wow <laughs> it makes you feel comfy because Joseph was a hero he was the one who saved you know the 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 fathers of the tribes of Israel his brothers from severe famine if not for Joseph being in Egypt his brothers and his father Jacob would have died in that in those seven years of famine he was the great deliverer okay and no wonder that the descendant, Hosea, would also be called by God one day to be deliverer of Israel. Okay, and we will see that today. And so Hosea was his original name. But later on, next, Moses changed his name to Yahoshua. That's where we get our English word, Joshua. Okay, let's take a look at Numbers 13, verse 16. Okay, Numbers 13, 16, you will see the how Moses changed his name okay so numbers 13 16 these are the names of the men Moses sent to explore them on the 12 spies that he sent to spy out the land before they entered the promised land Moses gave Hosea son of Nun the name Yahoshua okay so if Hosea means save salvation what is the meaning of Yahoshua Yahoshua is a compound name containing two words, Yah, which is the shortcut for Yahweh, which is the personal name of God revealed to Moses during the Sinai experience. Remember, this is now, they're, they're about to enter the promised land. This is now 40 years later, Mount Sinai experience. In Mount Sinai, God revealed himself to Moses for the first time with his personal name, I am that I am okay I am who I am and that that is in Hebrew Eye, Asher, Eye, and Yahweh is the third person singular of Eye. Eye is I am third person singular would be he is okay so Yahweh simply means he is I am come first person he is third person so Yahweh means he is and Yahweh, the Lord said this is my name forever by which I will be remembered he said to Moses in Exodus chapter 4 and he said this is the name by which I will identify myself with my people Israel Yahweh is God's covenant name okay so how many of you when you were courting your your girl you know the girl of your dreams Hopefully, the one that's sitting beside you now. <laughs> you know, meron kaya mga special names that you call each other, you know, to make it very unique, right? Right? Okay? So, that name that you gave, the special name, very, 
you know, uh, a very, uh, you call that, a name that expresses affection or special relationship, no? Di ba? So, that is what you may call your covenant name. Tayong dalawang, tipanan natin to Ito pangalan ko. Okay? So, God said, this is my name forever. And that name is Yahweh. Okay? And so, it, be, it was contracted to Yah, okay? Because people were afraid to pronounce the full name of God. Okay? They could not say the full name because they, they might uh, break the second commandment, uh, the third commandment that says, you shall not make the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay? And so when they use the name of Yahweh as an attachment to names, they have to cut it. So they are not able to pronounce the full name. So, Yah. No way. Walang yung way. Yah, and then the next word will be another, another word to attach to the name Yah. So, Yahoshua. Okay? So, Yahoshua simply means Yahweh saves. Okay? So, now I'm going to ask you the question, why do you think Moses changed the name of Hosea, salvation, into Yahoshua before they entered the promised land? Why? Because Moses was trying to tell the people because they will call on the name of Joshua from then on because he will be their leader in place of Moses who was going to die as God prophesied to him. And because he will always be pronouncing the name of Hosea, Moses did not want the people to think that because his name was Hosea that he is their savior. See, when you say Hosea, that means salvation, savior. It looks that the guy is the savior, right? So Moses wanted it clear, the one who will bring salvation to Israel in their battles against the Canaanites in the conquest was not Hosea, but Yahweh. Because he said, I'm going to change your name Hosea so that people would not think because of your name, you are the savior, you are not. It is Yahweh who will lead you into battle. It is Yahweh who will hand over to the armies of Israel, the inhabitants of the land. It is Yahweh who will destroy them before you. It is Yahweh who fights the battles for you. That's why I'm going to change your name. I'm going to change your name from meaning Savior of Salvation to Yahweh is your Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. So that's the significance of the changing of name of Joshua. And I'm sure Joshua was very delighted to have that name because he's such a worshiper of Yahweh as we will see in the next messages in this series. He was a, a very passionate worshiper of God. Okay? So, Yahoshua. And another thing we will learn from him is that Yahoshua is actually the Hebrew name of Jesus. Jesus is from Jesus in Greek actually comes from the Hebrew of the Aramaic, Yeshua. Can you say Yeshua? Yeshua is the Aramaic name that Jesus was familiar with because from the time he grew up until he was old, the people in the land of Palestine at the time spoke Aramaic as their dialect. Okay? The Hebrew language was confined to the synagogue and the temple. Okay? Their Bible was written in Hebrew, but their conversations every day was in Aramaic. Parang kung sa atin, Taglish. Corrupted, uh, corrupted Hebrew, in a sense. Okay? Aramaic language. Okay? So Jesus would have known, would be known by the name Yeshua. But that is the Aramaic. The Hebrew, the Hebrew equivalent of Yeshua is Yehoshua, which is the very name of this man. Okay? In other words, Moses, when he changed the name of Hosea to Yehoshua, was not just signifying that Yahweh is the one who says, but he did not know, or maybe he knew it because, you know, he, can re he receives revelations from God. Maybe he was aware that by naming Hosea Yehoshua, he was saying that this man will be foreshadowing the coming Savior of the world. Because he carries the name that will be the same name that the angel will say to Mary, that the son that will be born of her shall be named Yahoshua. Do you understand this? Because Yahoshua was the great leader and deliverer of Israel who led them in their battles in the Canaanite and conquered all their enemies. 
And therefore, they were able now to capture the land and settle in it according to God's promises. Okay? So, there's another point. When did Joshua became acquainted with Moses, the great prophet and leader? He was acquainted with Moses since he was a young man. Okay? Take a look at Numbers 11:28. Okay? In other words, Moses started with Joshua while he was still a young boy. So by the time that he commissioned Joshua to fight against the Amalekites, Moses and Joshua had a long, many years of relationship already. But the first time we see the name of Joshua, the name that Moses gave, the first time we see that is in Exodus 17, where we are getting into because that is the first time that Joshua is ever mentioned as being part of the story of the Exodus. Do you understand this? Okay? So, that's why he said, Joshua son of Nun, who has been made Moses' aid, aid in the Hebrew means assistant. Personal assistant. So he has been Moses' personal assistant since he was young. By the time he was asked by Moses to lead the war against the Amalekites, we will see that today, he was around 45 years old. So we don't know at what age did he become Moses' aide or assistant, personal assistant. Probably, probably in his 30s when he started being with Moses, okay? So we don't know how long. But remember, they have been in the wilderness now for how long? 40 years. You know the story, right? The Exodus generation were about to enter the land, but because they rebelled against God, because they saw the giants in the land, they said, let's go back to Egypt. Let's leave this Moses and find another leader. God was so angry because of the rebellion. And he said, Moses, I'm going to, you bring these people back to the wilderness. I will cause them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until this generation who rebelled against me dies. And only their children, except for Joshua and Caleb, only their children it will enter the land. Do you understand that? Okay, now listen carefully. Joshua here being Moses' aide, after 40 years of being with Moses, was later going to be commissioned by God himself to be the successor of Moses. Later on, we will get into Joshua chapter 1. What we're doing now is laying the groundwork for the book of Joshua. So you get to understand the preparation of Joshua became, before he became the leader of Israel after the death of Moses. Okay? Are you ready for this? Okay? So, let's take a look at what's happening here in chapter 17. Let's read from verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin. Okay, here it is. Exodus 17 verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. Again, the ages that are given by commentators are only conjectural. Okay, we cannot really know the exact age. But we know the age when they already conquered the land. They, there is very clear what the age of Joshua was. Okay? The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camp at Rephidim. Can you say Rephidim? Rephidim is a Hebrew word which means resting place. Okay? It's very interesting as we read the story, the resting place will become a wrestling place with God. Okay? Very ironic. Okay? They come at Rephidim, and, but there was no water for the people to drink. Again, next verse. So they quarreled with Moses. Can we say quarreled? Give us water to drink. And Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Okay, next verse. But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. And they said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Wow. What a judgment. So they are saying, You know, Moses, I think you brought us here just for us to be killed by thirst. <laughs> Can you imagine where these words are coming from? What kind of attitude did the people have to have said this against Moses? Let's take a look at the next verse. 
Then Moses cried out to God. Amen. This is the first time that you hear Moses crying out to God. He was already getting exasperated by these people. You know why? Because just before chapter 17, in chapter 14, we see how Israel crossed the Red Sea. Okay? And after crossing the Red Sea, they went to Elim. Elim was a place, an oasis in the midst of the wilderness. Okay? Elim was a place with many trees. And you know, when there are many trees, there is water. Okay? And so they were so excited, they came to this, you know, oasis in the midst of the wilderness where there were many trees and they were all running. Remember, do you know how many people were with Moses when they went out of the Egypt? Okay, estimated to be about two million. Two million. Can you imagine the burden of Moses? <laughs> and imagine if all the men of those two million are quarreling with him. <laughs> Okay, and listen to this. He, at Elim, but they went there, they, they start to drink from the water, but the water was bitter. And so they complained, what are we going to drink? We're going to die of thirst. That was the first grumbling after the crossing of the Red Sea. It's about water. And guess what they're grumbling again about? Water again. Okay? So they were grumbling about water because the water was bitter. And so God spoke to Moses. He showed him a piece of wood that he, I want you to throw it into the waters to make it sweet. And he did. And the waters became sweet. So it's problem solved. Okay? And then they started grumbling again. Where are we going to eat food? <laughs> Our food supply has already run out. We're going to die here. I mean, if you were the leader... How would you feel? These people have seen the, the great power of God in Egypt, the ten plagues. God opened, the, did the impossible. He opened the Red Sea, and the Red Sea became like a road, you know, for them. And then later on, the entire Egyptian army that pursued them was swallowed up by the Red Sea, and, everybody, and all, the, all the army died there. What awesome power of God, right? And now they're complaining about water and food. What is it that they have missed? In all the signs and wonders they beheld in Egypt. Did God prove himself trustworthy for his people to defend them and to provide for them? Right? Pakisabi sa inyong katabi, Kuminsan, makalimutin tayo that how has God has blessed us in the past, how God has been so faithful, and though today we're worrying and grumbling. Hebrews 13 says, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is unchanging. If He was faithful in the past, He will be faithful today. Why do we grumble? Why do we complain? It seems we forgot who God is and what He has been to us. You understand that? They have seen all these awesome things that no human on earth, according to Deuteronomy, the last chapter, no one in the history of the world has ever been instrumental in, you know, in ushering these awesome events. The opening of a Oh, you'd see. Has that happened anywhere in history? Besides the Exodus? No. I mean, the ten place, although there were chaos coming into Egypt, it was ordered chaos. Show the sovereignty of God even over chaos itself. He's able to arrange chaos in an orderly manner. They understand that. You know why? Because the Egyptian Pharaoh... Being God in flesh. That's why his name is Pharaoh. Can we say Pharaoh? Ra is the supreme God of the Egyptians. The sun God. Ra. Pharaoh means he is the human representative of Ra. Therefore, Pharaoh is God. Is Ra in flesh. Okay? And because Pharaoh, the Pharaoh in English, 
is viewed as God, his duty as God is to maintain order in the universe. The word, the Egyptian word that describes the job description of Pharaoh is the word ma'at. Can we say ma'at? Ma'at means order. So the job of the Pharaoh was to maintain order in creation. And you see what the God of Moses did. Right? He challenged Pharaoh by sending him nature in chaos and see if he can order it. <laughs> Did Pharaoh succeed in preserving order in the midst of all the chaotic things that God sent to Egypt? He failed. He lost. God was trying to show the Egyptians, your God is no God. He is no much to me. I sent him chaos. He could not control it. Therefore, he is not God. The, the Rosalis. I, God, I send chaos, but chaos in an orderly manner. <laughs> Amen? Do you understand this? Okay? And so the people saw that. They saw how awesome the God of Moses was. Their God, the God of their forefathers. And now they're grumbling, where do we get water? Where do we get food? Just like the disciples, after the miracle of the loaves, after that they said, you know, where are we going to eat? And Jesus said, Didn't you understand the meaning of what happened there? I just fed more than 5,000 people with bread and fish, and now you're grumbling and asking, Where do we get food? So, no difference are the disciples from the Israelites, right? Are we the same? <laughs> Confessedly forgive us, Lord, for our insulting doubts and unbeliefs. Do you understand that? Amen? Pagkasabi sa katabi, the more you complain, the more you will not be blessed. Because you are testing God. Sinusubukan mo ang Diyos by complaining. That's exactly what Moses was saying. So the people came to him grumbling about where we're going to have water. You know, Elim was the first grumbling. You know the second grumbling? Second grumbling, they were back in the wilderness. And this time, they were grumbling for food. So God said, okay, I'll send manna, bread, in the morning, and I'm going to send quail in the evening. Bira mo, breakfast mo, tinapay, panghaponan mo, bird meat. Quail eggs. Hindi, quail eggs, ha? quail meat. Okay, parang manok, chicken. Okay? So, I mean, have you ever known in history a people were fed from heaven by bread and fed from heaven by, you know, quails? The quails will come always at the right time every day. Maraming schedule ba? Pag mala dinner, dadami, mga quails will be coming to the camp of Israel. Imagine, mga 2 million yun, ha? Those are 2 million people. Imagine how many quails are going there just by the command of God. Just as he commanded the ten plagues, now he commands the quail and the bread to fall. The manna. Amen? You know what manna means? It means, what is it? Because that's what they said. When it was swallowed from heaven, ano to? Ano yan? Ano yan? What is it? What is it? Manna. Manna. I didn't know na manna kasi what is it? They understand this. So manna that represents grain from heaven. Okay? So, and so God was so angry with them because they were grumbling again. But they said, okay, I'll give them instructions. I will test them if they'll obey me. You, you gather as much man as you are for the day, okay? But don't gather for the next day. And the Bible said, and God was testing them. They will obey instructions. You know what? There are some Israelites who disobeyed and they saved some of the manna for one day for the next day. You know what happened the next day? You know why? You know why they want to save for the next day? Because they don't want to go out there and looking for it again. Mga lazy people. They don't want to work. They don't want to go out looking for mana. So they gathered more than one day and save it for the next day. You know what happened the next day? When they opened the bowl, it's full of maggots and very smelly. And when God saw that, he was so angry. These people cannot follow instructions. 
You understand that? And he commanded them, on the sixth day, that's when you gather for two days worth of bread. Because on the seventh day, you cannot go out. And you cannot go out because I won't be sending manna. Okay? And so they gathered twice on the sixth day. On the seventh day, they, when they opened their bowels, the manna was not, did not have maggots or was not smelly because God preserved it for the next day. Okay? But there were some who were still against stubborn. They tried to go out and look for manna on the seventh day. When God saw that, he was even more angry. Pakisabi sa katabi, sumunod ka kasi sa instruction. Marunong ka pa sa Diyos. God was angry because they could not follow basic instructions. Their actions revealed that they do not trust God. Are still here? You know, God knows. He sees your heart when you're doing something or saying something because you don't trust God. God can see that. You cannot hide anything from God. That's why Hebrews 11.6 was written. Hebrews 11.6, For without faith, it is impossible to please God. Who wants to please God? Then do not doubt. Do not doubt. Okay? So, he, for he who comes to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who earn it. When you're earnest in seeking God, you can be sure God will grant you what you're asking for. But don't you dare doubt God. Because according to James chapter 1, verse 6, the one who doubts up to verse 8 should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So when you doubt, what does James say? Don't expect to receive anything. You just insulted God. You made him look like he's a liar because you're doubting his word. That was the problem of the Israelites in the wilderness. Again, that they cannot take God at his word. They have to do something because they don't trust God enough. Are you still here? So God was offended not because they were looking for food, but because of their attitude of unbelief and mistrust in God. Okay? So, even after the quail and the manna, here we go, they get to Rephidim. <gasps> We're gonna die of thirst! Now, did not God provide water for them? Did not God open the Red Sea for them? Did not God protect them from the ten plagues in Egypt? It hurt the Egyptians, but not the Israelites. That's a miracle. Now, why are they saying, We're going to die here of thirst! So what is their concept of God? That God doesn't care. Is that true? In their past experiences, is it true that in their past, God was never faithful to them? God did not care for them? Was that true? Was that true? No. Now, can you imagine how insulting this attitude is to God? After all that he has shown them, his love, his care, his faithfulness, say, we'll die of thirst. And always the problem is the human leader. Can you say to the person beside you, the human leader becomes the target of the grumbling. Do you understand that? So, the people came to Moses, go back to chapter 17. So the people come to Moses and grumbled against him. And he said, give us water to drink. And Moses replied, in verse 2, Why do you quarrel with me? I am not your source. I am not your security. I'm just a human being. I'm just a utusan. Why do you look to me for all your needs? I cannot give you what you need. And then he said, Why do you put the Lord to the test? Now, do you know why he said that? Okay, do you know why he said that? He said that because in Exodus 16, 8, this is what Moses and Aaron said to the people. Just the chapter before, Exodus 16, 8. Please read this with me. And you'll understand why Moses was really affected. Moses said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You are not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. 
So, when the people were grumbling against Moses, what, what does he know? He, they are grumbling against God. You understand that? Why are you grumbling against me? Are you putting the Lord to the test again? Every time you grumble against me, God gets affected. Because I don't stand here on my own authority. I am here because God appointed me. And whatever complaint you lodge against me affects God. Because I am not your security. God is. The other sound is, how many of you have been leaders and you've been so exasperated from the non, you know, unending sometimes, you know, criticism and quarreling of people with you? Yeah. That is one of the challenges of leadership. That is where our leadership is being tested. And that is the crucible that is intended to produce Christ-like character in us. Okay? A sword cannot be refined to its best capacity to be a very sharp sword until it goes through the fire. Gold cannot be refined until it goes through the fire. And let me tell you, as a leader, God will bring, allow you to be tested by the people you serve. And they will exasperate you. They will quarrel with you. They will be filled with all kinds of criticism against you. And they do not know that they are being used by the enemy to bring down the leader. But listen to this. As a leader, what do you do? You don't allow it to affect you. And we see the secret of Moses, why he was not affected. And we will see the secret of jo Joshua, who is now about to be tested by God. Okay? So, the background here is that Moses, why do you quarrel with me? Every time you quarrel with me, you're putting God to the test. And you know my problem? I have to be a referee again between you and the God. Okay? And so, the reaction of uh, Moses, verse 4, that's why Moses cried out, God! Why am, what am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. What have I done wrong for them to do this to me? How many of you said that as a leader? After all the good you've done, people want to stone you. Right? How many of you experienced that? Praise God, you're not alone. <laughs> okay? So they're always trying to stone you, grumble against you. They're almost ready to stone me. Are you saying the secret of Moses was able to overcome because of his intimacy with God? May sumbungan siya. God is the one who hears the cries of his heart. He doesn't cry out to people because people will fail. How many of you, when you're in your downest moments and you feel like the world is against you, and you try to seek help from a friend or seek counsel from a friend, and then this friend disappoints you? And then you're left with nobody else. Sometimes even your family may not understand you. And so here you are alone. And listen to this. God is allowing that to happen so that you will find your security in God alone. So that you will know that there is no security apart from God and maintaining an intimate relationship with God will enable you to receive the strength, the grace, and the courage to overcome these problems with people. Without that intimacy with God, you will not stand. You may quit. Or even sometimes for some, commit suicide. I'm sure you have heard the story of that pastor in America. I mean, beautiful kids, beautiful wife. Maybe the wife never knew what her husband was going through and just suddenly ended his life as a pastor. And so, so many articles have been written across the world because of that on pastors also get depressed. <laughs> they understand that? Okay, so. Moses was saying, what am I to do with these people? 
And how does God respond? Verse 5, the Lord answered Moses, Go out to the front of the people. Lord, I just told you they're about to stone me. And now you're telling me to go in front of them. Ano yung firing squad? Come on, stone me. Come on, stone me. <laughs> God will oftentimes tell you, even when the world is against you, stand before them. Because this is not about you anymore. This is about me, and I am your vindicator. Are you still here? So God is not saying, when you're so much, almost crushed by people's endless criticisms, listen to this, don't fall. Stand. Because I'm about to vindicate my servant. I will show them who you are to me. Are you still here? Amen? Even if the world criticizes you and you know you're doing God's will, God is saying, stand in front of them. Do not be afraid. They cannot stone you because I stand with you. Hallelujah. Don't quit the ministry. Don't run away. Stand and trust God. If He puts you there, He will keep you there. You understand that? This is one of the challenges of leadership. When you're a leader, you become so visible that you're a favorite target practice of people. That's why so many people don't want to be leaders because they know they will be target practice. Eh? You understand that? For my many years in the ministry, and more than 37 years, I've experienced being a target practice of so many people. And there were times in Manila, I wanted to quit. But the Lord said, stand. Stand in front of them because this is not about you what they're doing against you they're doing against me I will stand with you you stand amen don't quit stand because God is with you amen heaven all of heaven stands with you amen and so he said go out in front of the people stand Take with you some of the elders of Israel. Lalo ni mga reklamador na yan. And take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. And listen to this. I will stand there before you at the rock at Horeb. By the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out for it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Masa and Meribah. Masa means, you know what Masa means? Okay? Masa actually means to test, to test. Testing. Because they're testing God. Okay? Meriba means quarreling. So he said, we will no longer call this Rephidim the place of rest. It's no longer the resting place. It's now to be called the wrestling place. Because it's where the people wrestled with God and grumbled against Him and tested God. Do you hear that? And in Mo, for Moses, it was so offensive that he said, May the people remember through the generations to come that this was the place where Israel quarreled with God and tested God. They thought they were quarreling with me, Moses. No, they did not know they were quarreling with God. Because, sabi ni Moses, Utusan lang naman ako. I'm just a servant. I'm just doing what God wants. If you attack me, you attack the one who ordered me to do what I do. You quarrel with me, you quarrel with the one who has appointed me to, to be your leader. Do you understand this? Okay? And so, is that a comfort for you as a leader? Amen? Don't quit. Stand in front of the people. Strike the rock, and the water will come out for the people to drink. Now, what was that rock? Okay, look at verse 6. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Horeb is the, play, the, the same mountain we call Mount Sinai. You got that? They were still in Rephidim. They have not yet really arrived at Horeb. They were about to go there. They will uh, be there by chapter 19. By chapter 19, that's when God appears at Mount Horeb and gives them His covenant. 
Okay? So he's saying, stand there before you. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. So many scholars have been asking, is that a stationary rock or a movable rock? Is the rock, is that a rock that they carry with them? So many conjectures, okay? So rock at Horeb. But regardless of what that rock was, listen to this, he was to strike the rock. And so Moses did inside the sight of the elders of the P Israel, because it's mga elders ang mga leaders sa reklamo. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Kayo mga reklamador, mga hindi manood kayo. Pang! He struck the rock, and suddenly water gushed forth from the rock. Okay? And he called the place Masa and Meribah because the Israel squatted and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Do you want to know the significance of that rock? Okay. The significance of the rock is this. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4. 1 Corinthians 10, 1-4. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. Talking about the what event? The Exodus. Next verse. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Which sea? The Red Sea. Next verse. They all ate the same spiritual food. Remember after they crossed the Red Sea, what was the first food? Manna. Bread from heaven. Okay? Next. And drank from the same spiritual drink. Where? Exactly our story. Where Moses struck the rock and water gushed forth. Okay? For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. <laughs> when the rock was struck, the water burst forth. God was foreshadowing, listen to this, spiritual realities from the physical reality. Everything in the story of the Exodus was prearranged by God to foreshadow Christ to come. Do you understand now? Now do you see the significance? Can you already begin to see the significance of striking the rock and after that the water gushes forth? Later on, Around 40 years later, in the wanderings in the wilderness, they will again ask for water. And God will say to Moses, Do not strike the rock. Speak to the rock. Numbers chapter 20, verse 7 and following. Numbers 27 and following. Now you understand the mystery of the rock at Horeb. The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You'll bring water out of the rock for the community so they can, the livestock can drink. So what is now going to strike the rock? Speak to the rock. Okay, next verse. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him, and the obedience of Moses stopped there. The next thing he's going to do was disobedience. Look at the next verse. He and Aaron gathered and assembled together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? I mean, Moses is clearly exasperated. He was doing, saying things and doing things that he should not be saying. Right? He was so angry and exasperated by these people, he made the biggest mistake of his life that cost him his destiny. Look at the next verse. <laughs> what did God say? Speak. What did Moses do? Once, twice. The water gushed out, yes. But look at the next verses. But the Lord said to Moses, that but is about to change the entire future of Moses. That but. But the Lord said to Moses, because you did not trust in me enough. You know, Moses, by not obeying me, you're just like the Israelites right now. Always testing me by not obeying my commands because they don't trust me enough. Now you're becoming like them. 
That's just the problem with anger. Anger transforms you and makes you like the other person. Tama? Kasi kokopyahin mo yung ginawa niya sa iyo. Eh. Sa galit mo, in your anger, you want to get even. You want to do the same thing he did to you. You just transformed in the wrong way. That's what happened to Moses. He was so angry. You did not trust me enough to honor me as holy. You should have obeyed me to show them I am Yahweh. I am not like any human being. Don't you behave like any human being because you are representing me. And I told you to speak to the rock. But you struck it not once, but twice. You will not bring this community into the land I gave them. Sorry, Moses, your destiny is off. I told you before, you will lead these people into the land that I promised to their forefathers. I am now taking that back. Because of what you have done, you will no longer lead them into the land. And that's where Joshua will rise up as the successor of Moses. Do you understand this? Now, how many of you are asking a question, why is God so cruel? After all the, the, the tremendous tribulations that Moses endured with his people, 40 years, you know, trying to manage a grumbling 2 million people. Always serving us. God, let me destroy them. Lord, Lord, don't do that. Please, Lord, if you don't forgive them, blot my name out of your book. I mean, if you... And after all that he has done, just one moment of disobedience cost him his destiny to be the one to lead the people into the land. How many of you feel that God seems to be so unfair? After all that Moses has done, Moses has endured 40 years enduring these people. And then, just like that, he lost his destiny. How many of you like to ask, Bakit naman ganun, Pastor? Are you interested? Because if not, I'll move on to the next topic. Are you really want to know? Say it loud. The clues were already given to us in 1 Corinthians 10. Jesus is going to be struck once and for all time. He cannot be struck again. Because that rock was a foreshadowing of Christ. And when Christ was struck on the cross, then the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. And in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is always depicted as the spring of living waters. Okay, let's take a look at uh, John chapter 4, verse 13 to 14. It's words to the Samaritan woman. Look at this. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, who is that living water that Jesus gives when you believe in Him? That when you have that, that water, you will never thirst again. Who is that water? John 7. Let's go to John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. On the last day and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Next verse. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. What is that? Next verse. This he meant, what? The Spirit. Whom those who believe in were later to receive. At that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now take a look at 1 John 10. That rock was a spiritual foreshadowing of Christ. The waters that gush out was a spiritual foreshadowing of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But the water, the Holy Spirit cannot be given until Jesus dies on the cross, is struck, and once and for all time, carries our sins so that God can forgive us and give us the Holy Spirit. You see the picture? The problem with Moses, he messed up God's pictures. He messed it up. Let's just speak to the rock because you cannot strike the rock more than once. Because I'm trying to foreshadow something in the future. And you disobeyed me. Now you struck it even twice. 
Moses at that moment may not really fully understood the full implications of his angry reaction. But from God's point of view, you're messing up my plans by your disobedience. Amen? You know, that's why not all of you should seek, should seek, you know, high leadership positions. Because to him, much has been given, much shall be required. The higher you go up, the greater responsibility God will hold you on to. Others may do certain things, but you cannot. With others, God can be very patient with them, but with you, He will not give you an extension of grace. Because you are His chosen for this particular task. And if that position, that mission is so critical to God, if that purpose is strategic in His kingdom, and you mess it up, the consequences are greater. Spider-Man, with much power, comes much responsibility and accountability in the end. You understand that? That's why, you know, as your pastor, I will be judged more strictly than all of you. And the higher a leader goes, God will be more strict with that leader. Amen? So anybody who wants to have very high leadership positions, yeah. But if God calls you to that, you have no choice but to obey. You understand that? You just have to be careful about your life. Because God will hold you to highest accountability than the ordinary Christians who are not in leadership positions. Are you still here? Do you understand my role as a leader? Do you know that what my position is a scary one? And if I compromise, I made the choice to destroy my life. I cannot compromise. Some of you can, and God will be patient with you. But maybe not with me. Because of the trust that I have received from God as a teacher of the Word of God. If I mess up my teaching, I'll be responsible. James chapter 3, verse 1 to 2. Teachers will be judged more strictly by God. They say, whatever I preach to you, I have to be very careful. It's the truth. That's why I study. To deliver to you what is truly the Word of God. Not opinions of people. Do you understand this? Okay, because I carry a heavy responsibility before God. Amen? Let's so take a look at the next slide now. I'll be previewing our topic next week. Exodus 17, we're just barely scratching Exodus 17. Next slide. The rock, the staff, and the sword. Okay? That's how I title this chapter. The rock, the staff, and the sword. Because the entire story revolves around those three objects. The sword of Joshua against the Amalekites. The staff that Moses held up, whenever he held it up, Israel was winning over the Amalekites. When it's going down, Israel was getting defeated. And the rock that was foreshadowing Christ, that was struck by Moses and gave them waters of life. Okay? Can you jump to slide five, please? You see, Moses faced challenges. Number one, he faced the challenge of leadership wear out. He was now crying, God, what are you to do with these people? Okay? He was wearing out. He was, you know, exasperated. Okay? Leadership wear out, that's a challenge. But you are able to keep yourself from wearing out when you have number two, which Moses possessed, intimacy with God. And I'm telling you, I've had many reasons to quit the ministry in the past many years. But there was only one thing that kept me going on. It's my father's love for me. And he will always encourage me and comfort me and remind me, I stand with you, son. Don't give up. Because I am with you. 
And because I always turn to God whenever I experience hurting things, I always turn to God. This is yours. This is not mine. The mean things that people do to you do not define you. It defines who they are. That's not your business. Your business is to choose to respond the Christ-like way. Because although what the mean things that people to you do to you do not define you, it defines them, what defines you is how you respond. Do you understand that? How you respond to the mean things that people do to you is what defines you. And so be careful how you respond. Amen? And Moses was able to respond without quitting because he was intimate with God. He turned over every burden to God. He was crying out to God, not to people, because people will just fail him. You understand this? Okay? And thirdly, in spite of the difficulty, when God said, strike the rock, you know, all this, they stand before the people. Lord, they're about to stone me. Stand in front of them. Obey. Unquestioning obedience is a challenge of leadership. Which means that no matter how very burdensome, how wearing, wearying your ministry is, God wants to say to you, stand for me. Because I stand for you. Do you understand this? Okay? Obey, even when it's hard. Obey. Do you understand this? Because in the end, it's not about your dreams. It's about the will of God and His purpose. Sometimes you can be so filled with visions for God that you lose track of what God really wants you to do because you're too excited I've started many things and many big things boom went down because it was not of God and finally I found my place at the foot of the Lord and say whatever you wish it shall be done my coming here was not of my own will I never wanted to come to Davao for the first time, I played Jonah. I said, Lord, give me three signs. First time I asked for signs. You only ask for signs when you're hesitant to obey. When the call is so clear. Do you understand this? But God, in His mercy, indulged me and gave me three miracles that I asked for. It was enough. I knew it was really God. Because the last one, somebody spoke to me. Somebody who never knew what was in my heart spoke to me. It is the will of God for you to know in, to go to Davao. I never told him anything. How did he know? It's the will of God for you to go to Davao. Never told anyone. You understand this? And so I came here out of obedience to God. And I will remain here because of obedience to God. You understand this? Amen? In the end, as Moses experienced, I'm questioning obedience to God in the end is what carries out your God-given destiny. Not your ambitions or dreams, but God's dreams for you, for His glory. Amen? Can we bow in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, because you have given us so many opportunities to show our love for you by serving you. Lord, some of us are in the ministry because we think that we will find our significance in the ministry. And some of us are in the ministry because it meets our needs for significance and worth. And now we realize how wrong that motive is. Because the ministry will not always affirm us. There will be times that the people will serve will come against us and wear us down. But thank you, Father. Though my heart and my strength may fail, you are the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And I thank you, Lord, that we are able to stand because your love is better to us than life itself. And thank you for your love that's always there to reassure us 
that as we faithfully obey, you continue, Lord, to fulfill your purpose and put all things in place in your way, in your time. Lord, you're put in my heart your love for all these people in this church. And Lord, you have heard me affirm that I love them as you have loved us. And I pray, Father, that they will learn to stand as leaders, never to back down or to quit or to run away, but to fulfill your calling without compromise. Not to allow people to affect us negatively because you're teaching us patience. You're teaching us endurance. You're teaching us forgiving love. And I pray, Lord, that forgiveness will truly be a way of life for us as leaders. Because it is by living a lifestyle of forgiveness that we will survive the hurts and the pains that ministry will bring. Because you stand with us all the time. And you are the protector of our hearts. Father, may you encourage every leader in this place through the words that you have spoken and allow them to know that when they stand alone in the midst of a crowd, they never stand alone because all of heaven stands with them as they do your will. I release your blessing to every leader in the church. Lord, may you make them strong. May they take courage and be faithful to carry out what you have called them to do. Not to back down or to withdraw, but to stand because you will be the one who will prove yourself faithful for them and in their behalf. And we thank you, Father, that you are going to allow us to bear much fruit for you and fruit that will last. Thank you so much, Father. Forgive us for our doubts. Forgive us for grumbling and complaining. Forgive us for testing you in so many ways because of our critical attitudes. Forgive us for testing you. We thank you for your grace in Christ. We thank you that in you we have rest. We thank you, Father, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Talking about leadership, there are always cycles of leadership in any church or any organization. There are seasons in the lives of every person. There will be a season when God will call you to rise as a leader in a particular workplace. And there will be a new season when God will move you to another sphere of ministry. And God prepares the one who will take your place. Amen? So that's why there is never a permanence of leadership. Because God wants to convey to His people, you do not look to the human leader. Because there will be seasons in His life that we must learn to look to God and take responsibility to fulfill our duty to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen? Encouraging one another, praying for one another, admonishing one another. All the one another's remind us that the pastoral ministry belongs to the people. Encouraging, praying for one another, you know, admonishing one another. These are teaching one another. These are all pastoral actions. And we're going to do it to one another. Amen? You cannot depend on me all the time because I'm not always there all the time. But God is always there. And your brother is there beside you to serve and to encourage. Amen? Praise the Lord.